It is my great pleasure to uh, introduce you again. Hi, <laughs> Rick Hatton. Uh, did you introduce Ferry this morning? All right, so we all, we've all met Ferry. Uh, did you bring pictures of all your kids to put up on the screen? All right, very good. Uh, Rick is, is our Awana missionary, and uh, we're very proud to have known him for, I don't know, probably 20 years. We're old, Rick. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Rick, why don't you come on up, and uh, we'll turn the rest of the service over to you. Is it working? So, thank you. It's good to be with you. And uh, yes, we got pictures uh, on the screen, and we gave them each one for the refrigerator. Asked my uh, grandkids if they'd like to be on our prayer card because uh, the older ki- our, our children have uh, grown and left home. And I got to think, well, you, you can't be in children's ministry and not have kids on your prayer card. And so uh, I said, Would you guys like to be on our prayer card? And they said, yeah. I said, you'll be on refrigerators across Nebraska. Cool. <clears throat> so anyway, they agreed to the bargain. Now you need to help me fulfill my end of the bargain. So get them up on your refrigerator. So anyway, we, uh, <clears throat> as I also mentioned, that uh, Ferry and I are celebrating 40 years uh, of marriage this uh, next week, July 6th. And uh, we're also on our 30th year, or will be... No, we're knocking on our 30th year as Awana missionaries, and that uh, benchmark comes up in January. So we uh, appreciate uh, your prayers, your support, and, and interest in our ministry through the years. Um, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then I'd like uh, to share a few things with you. Father, we love you, and uh, thank you for the day that you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity to freely gather and, and to enjoy loving you and uh, uh, getting to know you better. Father, you've said in your word that you're not impressed with uh, uh, how much we know or, or who we know or who knows us or uh, how much we have. Uh, but what uh, is important is that we understand and know you. And so, Father, we uh, would pray that during the next uh, few minutes as we look into your word, uh, as we consider who you are, that uh, you just help us to grow in love with you and appreciation, and uh, to uh, uh, that uh, you would uh, endear yourself to us as we uh, consider your word. And help us, Father, then to have the same burden that you have and desires that you have, and take that to the world before us. And we'll thank you in Christ's name, amen. Uh, one of the things I enjoy doing as I, I read through the scriptures is I, I like looking for, uh, for God's heart. And uh, in fact, I've written myself several reminders in the front of my Bible, and uh, one of them is, uh, listen for God's heart. And so uh, I would like to just share with you a little bit of of some of what I've been learning as I've uh, tried to listen for God's heart. And uh, as uh, Pastor Hugh mentioned, there is uh, a hand out there with a few blanks that you can fill in as well. I'll be referencing... uh, uh, a number of Bible verses that uh, probably be moving uh, fast enough that you're not going to have time to look them up, but I have given you those references there. But uh, as I, I look through the scriptures and looking for God's heart, one of the places that I find that and uh, of late have been intrigued with is uh, in the, uh, uh, his covenant with him. By the way, I'm, I'm going to let you know, I told the folks in Sunday school, I've been working on a cold this week, so... I'm trying to manage the voice, but it's kind of like the old projector. If it goes out, it's uh, five minutes before it comes back on, so uh, uh, I may have to take uh, awkward pauses to, uh, to uh, take care of myself here, but I apologize for that. But uh, one of the places I've, I've seen his heart is, is, is in the covenant. And uh, as was uh, read to us earlier, God... Uh, uh, started to, to spell out what the heart of that covenant really was as he prepared to put the pressure on Pharaoh. And uh, you recalled uh, in the uh, scriptures that were read this morning that uh, the Lord had, uh, had uh, sent Moses to the children of Israel in, in uh, Egypt, and uh, he was going to use Moses to get them out. And the people were getting excited. They had somebody coming to deliver them. But uh, Moses had gone to Pharaoh and, and said, the Lord wants you to let his people go. 
And so Pharaoh thinks, uh, these guys must be bored. So they up the ante on the brick quota. And, uh, and then uh, the, the Israelites are not so sure that this Moses guy is, is exactly what they were looking for. And so they start whining at Moses. And so the Lord, uh, Moses goes to the Lord and starts whining to the Lord. He says, what are you doing here? I mean, this is all backfiring so far. And the Lord said in uh, Exodus 6, 7, he said, uh, uh, you're going to see what happens now. And then he said, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you should know that I am Yahweh, your God, who's brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. So I like to call it the deal, the, the covenant. I, with all due respect, I, I, I kind of refer to the covenant as, as the deal. And uh, the deal is, God says, uh, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. And I'm, I'm going to be working this over here this morning, and I'm really hoping that uh, in this phrase, in this heart of the covenant, you will start to catch a glimpse of, of God's heart. And so uh, the heart of the covenant is, is that God wants to get close. He wants to get close. And uh, so anyway, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Mount Sinai here. And uh, I like words. My daughter, Celeste, and I do this little thing with the text, and uh, we have what we call DWDs, Dad's Word of the Day or the Daughter's Word of the Day. And so, you know, I'll text some things. But anyway, as, uh, I love words. But uh, I was fascinated to find out that covenant, a synonym, an English synonym for our word covenant is convention. Now, it's not a Hebrew type of thing, but it's kind of an English thing that's kind of neat. So I like to refer to Mount Sinai and the, the giving of the law and the, all of that as the, the, the Sinai Convention. And uh, so we're going to spend some time uh, talking about that. Well, let me give you a little bit of an overview of history. Uh, we go back in Genesis, and, uh, and God uh, created the world, and then shortly after, sin enters the world. And as God created the world, he, he said it's good. It is very good. And he was pleased with how he created the world. And then sin comes along and just spoils it. And, it. and it creates this estrangement uh, between God and his creatures, whom he created to love and to have this relationship with and great delight in. And sin just fouled all of that up. It fouls it up for us. But sometimes I don't think we realize how much it hurt God to have all of a sudden this thing uh, be a breach in the relationship. And so from the get-go, he's had the, the desire and the plan to restore this relationship and to have this, uh, this relationship with his people. And uh, so you go along, and in Genesis, you get the, the things get so bad that we, the Lord has to destroy the, the, the world with a flood. And then uh, you get the, uh, the, the scattering of the people by the uh, many different languages that are given to them. And then in chapter 12, the Lord starts to focus on a man and a family, Abraham and the Jews. And uh, Abraham has uh, uh, a son, Isaac, and Isaac has the two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob has uh, a baker's dozen uh, of kids, 13 kids, 12 sons and a daughter. And, uh, of course, the, the most uh, um, famous of the sons was Joseph, who... Uh, uh, gets sold into slavery and, uh, and saves the nation of Egypt as well as his own people uh, during the time of famine. And so he invites his family, uh, Jacob and his father, Jacob and, and his brothers, to come to Egypt where he takes care of them during the, the famine. And so they go down uh, in Genesis. Jacob and his clan go down uh, a, a family of about 70 people into Egypt. And they're down there for 400 years, and things change on them. Uh, Pharaoh eventually comes into power, who's not familiar with Joseph or his family, and uh, soon starts to be th feel threatened and uh, puts the, uh, the family of Israel into uh, servitude down there. Well, in those 400 years, they, uh, they grow to be a small nation. And uh, when Moses comes and, and, and uh, delivers the people of Israel, they leave e Egypt 
uh, on that night. Uh, and the, the Bible says that there were 600,000 men. Now, uh, we know that every man's going to have his wife, and they're probably going to have a couple of kids. In fact, the Bible says that the, the, the Israelite women are very prolific, so uh, they probably had more than that. But uh, you take 600,000, and it's, it's not hard to come up with uh, at least two and a half million people. And, you know, we kind of had this picture in our mind of this uh, Israelites crossing the Red Sea, probably about like 70 people. No, it was, it was two and a half million people. Um, I can't remember what the population of Nebraska is. Nebraska about 2 million, I think. Is it? I can't remember. Anyway, but, I mean, we're talking small little nation. And, uh, you know, and then they go out in the wilderness. And somebody has once figured out, you know, you're out in the wilderness and, and you got 250,000 people to take care of. And, and somebody figured out how many boxcars of manna that would be a day to feed and how many tank, uh, train tank cars of water it would take to, to, to take care of uh, two and a half million people out in the desert. I'm a little more practical than that. You know, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I'm thinking sanitation, you know. Uh, I remember when uh, we went to the Olympics in, in Utah, and Celeste and I went up to the Utah Olympic Park, and, 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 and I'm an organizer, and I just, you know, I enjoyed, I'm not so much a sports fan as I am just, I like, I was intrigued with what Mitt Romney did to, to save the, the games and orchestrate that whole thing. But we get out there and, and uh, we go through the, the screening area and, and you look around, there's hundreds of Santa cans. And I, I got excited. I thought, wow, somebody would have had to figure out how many Santa cans to order for the event here. I think, whoa, and I, I just getting, you know, I appreciate the, the detail. Uh, but uh, anyway, you know, so I'm thinking, sanitate, you know, two and a half million people, you know, it's not just a little band of, of people wandering around. It's this many nation wandering around, living in tents. And, you know, I'm thinking, what'd they do? I mean, they give everybody a shovel? I mean, think of the flies. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I get down to earth. You know, it's, it's, uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, there, this get, you got the picture. This is a, a, a big group wandering around. And, and the Lord, he, he's hauling them down. Uh, he hauls them down to Sinai because they've been paganized in Egypt for 400 years. And, and the Lord's going to come out and he says, uh, we're going to uh, start to help you understand who I am. Because prior to this, the Lord revealed himself in, with his name and, and uh, different ways uh, uh, to Abraham and, and uh, Isaac and, and Jacob. But uh, now at Sinai, you're going to get this information dump, this revelation dump. All of a sudden, the Lord is just going to give this boatload of, of knowledge and information about himself. And so they're, they're out there. I saw a Sunday school illustration once and just showed this uh, picture of Sinai. And then there are just uh, hundreds of little rectangles, just uh, this big panorama representing all these tents. And I thought, yeah, it, it, with two and a half million people, there have been a it had been a panorama city, you know. And uh, so they get to Sinai, and the Lord says to Moses, Moses, I, I'm going to paraphrase greatly here, so you'll have to forbear me, with me. But uh, Moses, uh, come up here. So Moses goes up to, to uh, Sinai, and the Lord says, here's the deal. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. Deal, no deal. Moses goes down. There's seven summits of Sinai. Okay, I'm going to give you seven summits. So that's summit one. Moses goes down and says, here's the deal. Yahweh God wants to be our God. He wants us to be his people. Deal, no deal. He said, well, deal. Moses goes back to summit two. Deal. The Lord says, okay, now go down and prepare the people for three days and then come back here and uh, I'm uh, going to uh, give you the, the, the terms of the, of the covenant. And so he does. He goes back up and uh, on uh, uh, Trip three, and the, the deal is elucidated. Okay, this is your vocabulary for the day. Anybody know what elucidate means? Look in the middle of the word. Look in the middle of the word. Lucid, okay. It means to make clear, to explain. So uh, the, he's going to lay out uh, the, the terms of the covenant. And the, in fact, this is what is called as the terms of the covenant. Here we have the Ten Commandments are given. Although it's not the stones, it's the Ten Commandments are given. And uh, he comes back down, and Moses reads all the, the terms of the covenant to him. 
and, and they say, are you still in on this? And they, they agree they are. And so uh, the Lord says, if they accept it, then I want you to come back up. Uh, you bring uh, yourself and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders, and you come back up, we're going to seal the deal with a meal. And so they go back up, and there's three fascinating verses here, just three fascinating verses. Usually, I, I, it took me many times reading through Exodus here before I actually caught that there was actually one trip up that was about 75 people went up on the mountain. And so they go up, and they, they actually see the, the, the Lord. At, in fact, uh, archaeologists have uncovered a rare photograph we have for you today here, and uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's of the Lord standing on a transparent pavement of sapphire. Uh, now, obviously, I'm funning with you, but uh, this is an illustration by Ted Larson. But uh, it's a fascinating picture of the Lord standing on a pavement of sapphire, and then they actually eat um, with the Lord there. So they go back down, and then the Lord says, okay, why don't you come up, Moses, and uh, trip number five, and we're going to uh, talk about the, the arrangements, the living arrangements. He says, you guys got tents. Y'all living in tents. He says, I want a tent. Make me a tent. I want you to make me a tent. And so uh, trip number five, uh, this is a time when he's up there for, uh, for 40 days. And uh, he also gets the, the stone tablets, the first of the tablets. But uh, primarily, I think what's going on is, is the Lord just spelling out the detail of how this tent is going to look for the Lord. And he says, I want to be right in the middle of the camp because I want to be with you. I want to be near you. And uh, what a fascinating thought that Yahweh, the creator of the, the universe, wants to get close to us. And he wants to be our God, and he wants us to be his people. And this being the trip that he's up there for 40 days, um, you recall that Israel got a little bit nervous and uh, impatient, and, uh, and so uh, uh, they think, this guy's not coming back. We're out here by our, I mean, we're, you know, and so they start talking about going back, and they talk Aaron into uh, making him a god, and so he does. And Moses comes down and, and comes face to face with the golden calf. He is serious. He breaks the tablets. And uh, then uh, uh, trip number six, Moses has to go up. And, and, and uh, actually over chapter 32 here, uh, that chapter, I have written my own title over that chapter. And I've written, the, my title for chapter 32 is, is Adultery on the Wedding Night. Because uh, this co a covenant's really a marriage, and the Lord's talking about uh, a close, intimate relationship and commitment to people, and and uh, and, and and so uh, it's it's as uh, special in, in the Lord's minds as a marriage. And before, you know, before they even come together, uh, Israel's in bed with another lover, and uh, and the Lord's serious, and Moses is serious, and you see, God is a covenant. Keeping God. When we see in Romans 3.23, the Lord says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I always wonder what the last part of Romans 3.23 meant. I've, I understood for all have sinned. Yeah, I get that. But fall short of the glory of God. But somebody said, you know, a basic definition of sin is sin is not being like God. And so whatever it is God has a problem with, uh, somewhere in there is it's because it's not like who he is. And so that's why... Uh, marriage is a special thing to him because he is this covenant-keeping God. And you see this uh, with this covenant here. So Moses goes up and, and he has to confess to, uh, uh, to God that, uh, that Israel has is, is already breached the contract. I mean, and, and here Israel has been on board with it all along. The Lord says, do you want to do this? You, I, I want you to be my people. I want you to be my, I want to be your God. And he and, and says, so, yeah, 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 okay, okay, good, well, and, 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 and uh, they've been on board all along. And now all of a sudden, they're, they're chasing after another God. And uh, so Moses goes back and, and confesses. And the Lord says, that does I'm not going with you. And one of the things the Lord said is, I will go with you. I will, be with, I will go with you. But so I'll, I'll send, my, I'll send my, my servant, but I'm not going with you. I'll kill him if I go with him. I said, I'm not going. I'll, I'll kill him. And Moses said, you got to go. You promised, Lord. I ain't going to go. I'm going to kill. I'll kill him. The Lord said, you got to go. Moses said, you got to go. You got to go. No, I'm, Lord said, I'll kill him. 
And, and, and so it goes. And finally, the Lord reminded them that it was his presence with them that made them unique among all the other nations of the, of, of the land. And so the Lord agrees to go. And uh, it was a, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, in fact, uh, let me back up a bit. So Moses comes down and he, and he wrecks the tent of meetings, not the tabernacle, but the tent of meetings outside the camp. And every morning Moses would go out and, uh, and as he walked out of the camp, the people would kind of stand shamefaced in, in their tent as, as he'd walk by and go out and he'd spend all day in the tent of meetings doing this wrestling with the Lord type of thing. And I mean, uh, history, our time stands still here for Israel as, they, uh, as they, they're, they're trying to say, okay, is Yahweh God going to go with us? And, and I mean, they all of a sudden, a very sober few days, and uh, as they're trying to figure out what's going to happen to them. And finally, the Lord agrees to, to go with them. And so then uh, Moses goes back up uh, the final summit, and the deal is renewed, and he gets a second uh, uh, tablets uh, of, uh, of the commands. Um, <clears throat> Victoria Brooks has said, uh, we are surrounded by relationships, but driven by accomplishment. God is the opposite. Though surrounded by his accomplishments, he has given himself in relationship. Though not in need of interaction, he has chosen to pursue it. For God, fellowship is the goal. And, uh, and so the Lord wanted this close relationship. He wants this exclusive relationship. I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. And so you see, when this covenant was made, uh, and, and when we come to know the Lord, the, it's, uh, we're his people. And there is no question about whether Israel was his people or that we as believers are his people. That is never in doubt. Whether he is our God from day to day, from our perspective, is always on the table. Is he going to be your God today? We're his people, if you know him as your Savior. But uh, uh, is he going to be, are you going to put another God in his place today? And so that is always the question there. I want to talk about what I call the prevalence of the, the deal. And uh, I, uh, I, I started noticing this phrase, I want to be your God, I want, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. And uh, that is, occurs in script, the Old Testament especially uh, um, a, a number of times. And I'm going to probably rehearse with you about a dozen of them here. And I'm going to read them to you, uh, somewhat redundant. But I, think, I want you to get the impact of this, okay? Uh, and just catch this phrase. And, and then hear God's heart about this closeness and, and desire that he has and, and wanting relationship with us. And again, these are all given to you uh, in your, uh, your notes there. Uh, Jeremiah uh, 7.23. But this command I gave them, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Walk in all the ways that I command you, that it may be well with you. Jeremiah 11, four, uh, 4, listen to my voice and do all that I have commanded you. So shall you be my people and I will be your God. 24, 7, I will give them a heart to know that I am Yahweh and they shall be my people and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. 30, 22, uh, you shall be my people and I will be your God. 32, 38, they shall be my people, I will be their God. Uh, 31, 33, this is also quoted pretty much verbatim in Hebrews 8, 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Over in Ezekiel eleven twenty, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. 14.11, that the house of Israel may no more go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, 
and that I may be their God, declares Lord Yahweh. Uh, Ezekiel 34, 30. They shall know that I am uh, Yahweh their God, and with them, with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares Yahweh God. Um, 36, 28. Uh, you shall dwell in the land that I give you, gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. 37, 23. But I will save them from all their backsliding in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Uh, 37, 27, and 28. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they uh, shall be my people. Then the nations will know that uh, I am Yahweh, who sanctifies Israel, when my sanctuary is in your midst forever. And, and this has been, all, and that's just two books of the Bible. Zechariah has some as well. I haven't counted how many times I see this phrase show up, but I had never noticed it. But it's what I call the heart of the covenant. You know, the covenant was lands and, and uh, descendants and everything, but, but, but the real heart of the covenant is this desiring God for closeness, to be our God and for us to be his people. And uh, this quote from, uh, of uh, Ezekiel occurs in Revelation 21, and I think you're familiar with it, almost verbatim from just what I, what I just read you. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place. Where does God live? The dwell- Where does God want to live? The dwelling place of God is with man. Give you goosebumps, doesn't it? And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. All the way through, this is what's been on God's heart. It was singling out Abraham, getting the nation to be this uh, illustration of his desire to be close to a people and to bless a people. And now we as his church, and he has given us this. And this has been his plan. And he still implores people today, saying, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. One more passage, and that's in uh, first, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 through 21 here. Uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, brought us back to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ in Christ, God reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. Uh, God imploring us uh, on, our be- on behalf of the Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who uh, knew no sin uh, to be sin for us, so we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so God continues to say to men, to women, to boys and girls, uh, I want to be your God, I want you to be my people. And we are his mouthpiece. We are his ambassadors saying to people, be reconciled to God. God wants to be close to you. He wants to be your God, and he wants you to be his people. Be reconciled to him. Father, we thank you for giving us a glimpse of your heart here. We thank you, Father, that you've actually uh, involved us in this ministry of uh, reconciliation to help people hear and understand this message, this heart of yours, that you want to be um, our God and you want us to be your people. Father, what a a wonderful thought uh, to think that the creator of the universe wants to be so close to us. And we thank you, Father, for that. In Christ's name, amen.